I have the pleasure of sitting today with uh, Carolyn Forche, an American poet whose first book, Gathering the Tribes, was a Yale Younger series selection, selected by Stanley Kunitz. It made her a well-known poet and uh, greatly respected. Uh, her second book, The Country Between Us, which won the Lamont Prize in 1981, has made her famous, in fact, world famous. Uh, it has the astonishing publishing and sales record of, of uh, having sold 60,000 copies. Uh, today, we're here on the occasion of her having published uh, a collection of poems concerning uh, what she calls poets against the extreme in the 20th century, poets oppressed by, by civil uh, oppression or political, military, and uh, other forms, poets from all over the world, and uh, 100, more than 140 of them. We are met here especially to talk about, those, about this collection and to, and I think especially, or I'm especially interested in hearing Carolyn Forche read from that uh, collection, her favorite, some of her favorite poems. Uh, but, I, but there are other matters that we may get to and other questions that we may ask. And I, I would like to say hello, first of all, Carolyn. Hello. Nice to be here with you. And uh, to ask you first uh, how you found a publisher these days when poetry gets so little notice, a publisher for a book of 800 pages. How did that happen? Well, for some years I'd been gathering the material and I ran into an old friend who asked me what I was doing these days. And I told him about the anthology that I'd been collecting and he said well that might be something for us and I said well where do you work these days and he said W.W. Norton and Company and of course I was flabbergasted actually because it's a very well-known company and especially for publishing anthologies when I went to New York to meet the editors there I was asked to give a presentation, which I didn't know I was going to give, and I was unprepared for, so I spent a half an hour extemporaneously talking about my project. And at the end of this talk, one of the editors asked me, well, what is a, a poet of witness? Uh, you're, you're talking about this poetry of witness, and could you tell us what a poet of witness is, and how is a poet of witness to be distinguished from, say, any other poet? Confessional poet. Exactly. And uh, I wanted to restrict, I had restricted my gathering to poets who had endured conditions of extremity in the 20th century, and I had confined myself to poets who had been interned in the camps during the Holocaust or who had suffered under during warfare or under military occupation or had been forced into exile or had been imprisoned or tortured in prison and in the case of South Africa poets who had been under banning orders or censorship or house arrest. So personal witness of these. Yes, poets who had actually been through these things themselves and had somehow survived and subsequently written poetry. I was interested in what these situations, what these experiences had done to the poet's imagination, to their language, and whether or not, regardless of the subject matter, whether one could feel this suffering and this extremity in the poems. And so when this gentleman at Norton asked me, well, what is a poet of witness, and can you give me an example of a poet of witness, I chose to tell the story of Miklos Radnoti. Miklos Radnoti was the foremost Hungarian poet of his generation, and in 1942 he was arrested by the Germans and forced marched to Yugoslavia, where he spent two years in a military labor camp. In 1944, the Germans realized that they were losing the war and for some reason decided to force march these laborers back into Hungary. They forced march some 3,000 laborers, and only 22 survived the march. Among them, the poet Miklos Radnoti. Um, when they got into Hungary, they tried to, the, the remaining soldiers who had accompanied the marchers, tried to put the marchers in a hospital uh, across the Hungarian line, and the hospital personnel were frightened, and they said, we have no room, we're full, go away, leave us alone. So the soldiers wanted to get rid of these prisoners and essentially get back to their units. So they took these prisoners to the forest where they were executed and buried in a mass grave. Two years after the war, Miklos Radnoti's widow, Fanny Radnoti, who is still alive to my knowledge, 
uh, went to the site of the mass grave with fellow villagers and they exhumed the grave site. They took out these 22 bodies and she went from corpse to corpse until she found the corpse that she identified as her husband's. And she went through his clothing and from the pocket of one of, of his pockets she pulled a small notebook and she peeled apart the pages and dried them in the sun. This notebook came to be called the Borscht Notebook, which contains the last poems that Miklo Shrednoti wrote, and they were written while on this march. And I explained to the publishers at Norton that these were the poems I wanted to include among those in this anthology, and that that's how I was envisioning this idea of the poet of witness, and somehow I think they were moved by the story and asked me subsequently, well, how long would it take me to finish the project? So I was, and that's how it came to be accepted. And how long ago was that, well, this first contact? Well, you know, I told them because I really wanted them to publish. I said I could have the book ready in a year. Well, that was four years ago, and I'd already been working on it for something like nine years before I, I went to Norton. So it, I think it was fully 13 years in the process. It is an amazing story. Yeah, the Radnoti story. Um, uh, in the country between us, uh, Carolyn Forche distinguished herself uh, as a poet of witness herself. It concerns her years spent in El Salvador, working for civil rights in El Salvador. And uh, some uh, remarkable people have praised her poems in that, in that way. And I want to read from uh, one of them. Uh, Denise Levertov, who is in a way the mother of social activism among uh, American poets, says, uh, Forche is creating poems in which there is no seam between personal and political, lyrical and engaged. And she's doing it magnificently with intelligence and musicality, with passion and precision. This new collection of uh, poems, which is called Against Forgetting, has uh, extraordinary early responses from uh, distinguished writers and critics all over the all over the world including Arthur Miller and Nelson Mandela it uh, could hardly be more distinguished in its in its launching and you must be pleased by by that part of it Carol I was thrilled the morning I had sent um, Nelson Mandela a copy of the book in tribute because I had spent some time in South Africa and subsequently received a, a fax from the president of the African National Congress and I nearly, I had a coffee in my hand when it came over the fax and I nearly spilled the whole thing on the floor. I was delighted. Well, it's quite a, quite a, quite a testimonial to have from Nelson Mandela. Um, as I say, I, I, I'm anxious to hear some poems from the collection, but uh, after hearing you talk about uh, how it came to uh, publisher, I, I, I had another question concerning its uh, preparation. Mm. Um, it was a long time in preparation, and I think anyone reading it would be impressed as I was, reading it, reading about in it, and reading your uh, introduction at the uh, astonishing education you've given yourself in the world poetry of this century concerning uh, uh, poets in extreme. And um, I, I, I wondered, apart from personal affinities uh, in this way, how you made your actual choices. Um, did you have a, a research team at the publisher? Um, is uh, is there a book on the subject that you consulted? I mean, how did you get to all of the, such an astonishing range of uh, poets? Well, I gathered this anthology because uh, one didn't exist yet. And I was, when I returned from Salvador, I think I was rather like a person who has a disease and goes to the medical library and starts reading everything they can find because I was confused about this relationship between poetry and politics and the arguments that were ensuing at the time of my return from Salvador concerning the relationship. And I, I was gathering this work to try to understand, well, what else had been written in the 20th century that might be accused of being political, and is there another way to view this work? And um, so there was no source book, and I was alone. 
essentially. There was no research team, but, uh, but I did have a lot of help. People started to realize that I was collecting this work and they sent it to me. And so my house filled up with, with books and pamphlets and monographs and Xeroxes of this kind of poetry. And um, I think that what I, a helpful decision I made early on was to restrict myself to work that had already been translated into English so that I didn't have to survey work in languages I was unfamiliar with. And I also was able then to, you know, to, to bring this collection down to something manageable. Ironically, it never became manageable. The original collection was 3,000 pages long, and this collection is 800 pages. And this is a compromise in the publishing process. We couldn't possibly publish the whole thing. It was deemed unaffordable. Did it, so. uh, did it diminish in size because you included fewer poems by each poet, or did you include fewer poets from...? Both. Mostly I had to eliminate poets, and many poets were not included. I would have liked to have seen included. Um, but I argued vigorously for every page of this present collection, and uh, the absent pages represent the arguments I lost. Yes. Well. And so I, I don't know really quite how to describe the process. I worked constantly, but not every day. And my, my house filled up with books and resources. And I did a lot of library work and consulted librarians and knowledgeable poets and scholars, especially when it came to deciding between one translation and another. And th those were the decisions that required extensive uh, consultation. So you did consult with, uh, say, native speakers in the yes. original languages and so on? Yes. Who also looked at the translations? Yes. Well, uh -huh. they, they were usually familiar with existing translations because I would you know, contact someone who knew Greek literature very well, 20th century Greek literature, and they would say, well, you must use this translation and that translation. And so it was very helpful. And, and they, in turn, recommended other poets or yes, of their they, they acquaintance? Yes. They would say, well, have you seen this poet or that poet? And some of the major translators um, of 20th century poetry are themselves poets in the United States, particularly. I think of um, poets such as W.S. Merwin and, and Robert Bly, uh, a number of them, and Mark Strand and Charles Simic have themselves extensively translated. Right. And they were very helpful as well. Um, I know that you teach full-time. You do teach full-time, yes, don't you, at George Mason University yes. in the creative writing department. I know that you are married and have a husband and son. Yes. And you have your own writing to do. <laughs> you, you have a new book coming out uh, in the spring of 94, I believe. Yes. So, so it's a, it seems to me a relevant question. How, do you, how in the world do you... Did you get any extended leave time? Did you have... Uh, leave with or without pay from the university? Did you have summers free? Did you, did you work on it in big blocks of time no, or not? No, uh, mostly steadily, little by little, and then big blocks of time in the last four years when I was trying to get it ready for publication. And I didn't have leaves. It simply took over my life. My son, my little son grew up with this book. It's so much so that we were on an Amtrak train once and he said, Mommy, Mommy, there's poetry back here on the train. And I followed him and there were cardboard boxes taped up behind the last seat in the car. And he thought that all cardboard boxes <laughs> contained poetry. And were on, on their way to your house, huh? <laughs> That's right. Well, he just never conceived that a cardboard box might have something else in it. <laughs> well, I'd love to ask you all kinds of questions about, uh, I suppose, writers' questions about, about the book. But I think, it, I think it, in fairness to, to uh, others who are watching, uh, we should hear some of these poems of, of witness. I'd like to begin with a poem by George Trockel. George Trockel was a leading avant-garde poet uh, who enlisted as a dispensing chemist or a, a pharmacologist in the Austrian army. And after the defeat of the Austrian army at Grodek, George Trockel found himself, he wasn't a doctor, he was a, a dispensing chemist, but he found himself in charge of 90 wounded men. And these 90 wounded men um, were suffering horribly, and he had no medications, and he wasn't able to help them. Several of them apparently committed suicide in his presence. And this caused 
George Trockel himself to begin to lose his mind. This is a poem called Downfall, written in that period, and it is an example of a poem that isn't directly about these experiences. But I, I began to feel as I read more and more of this work that if a poet was imprisoned or was had a horrible experience of warfare and subsequently wrote poems, one could feel that, like say it wrote a poem about a snowfall, one could feel the imprisonment in the snowfall. So these aren't necessarily poems that directly treat their subjects, and this is an example with downfall. Above the white pond, wild birds have flown away. In the evening, an icy wind blows from our stars. Above our graves, night leans down with its shattered forehead. Under the oaks, we rock in a silver skiff. The town's white walls keep ringing. Beneath the arches of thorns, oh, my brother, we are the blind hands climbing toward midnight. It's marvelous. Mm. Who is the translator of that? Do you uh, Daniel Simcoe, who published a volume called Autumn Sonata, which contains all of these translations. I first read uh, Trockel in a James Wright translation yes. years ago. Yes. Wonderful poet. This is a poem by Anna Akhmatova, the great Russian woman poet of the early part of this century. She actually lived until 1966, and she, I think she is the greatest of Russian poets and one of the greatest women poets of the world in the 20th century. But in, um, during the period after the revolution in the Soviet Union, she lived through a terrible period in, in Leningrad. The chief of police was a man named Yaskhov, and her, her son was imprisoned at that time in Leningrad, and she, as, as the other mothers, with the other mothers, would gather outside the prison and stand in line with baskets of bread and sausage and things that they had prepared, hoping to smuggle these things through a guard into the prisoner. Um, no one ever knew whether these baskets reached the prisoners or not. But at, and Anna Akhmatova was already a poet then, and she was standing in line with the others, and she writes a poem called Requiem for her son. This is, by the way, the translation of Stanley Kunitz and Max Hayward. And uh, this is, I will read just the beginning of this poem and its preface. Requiem. No foreign sky protected me. No stranger's wing shielded my face. I stand as witness to the common lot, survivor of that time, that place. Instead of a preface, in the terrible years of the Yeshov terror, I spent 17 months waiting in line outside the prison in Leningrad. One day, somebody in the crowd identified me. Standing behind me was a woman with lips blue from the cold who had, of course, never heard me called by name before. Now, she started out of the torpor common to us all and asked me in a whisper, everyone whispered there, can you describe this? And I said, I can. Then something like a smile passed fleetingly over what had once been her face. That's a wonderful example, a deliberate example in a way of poetry of witness, huh? She, this was the first poem that moved me as a young girl. And I, it was the first poem that told me what poetry of poetry's responsibility, in a sense, of what was really at stake here. And um, so I, I was always fond of this poem in this particular translation, and maybe it was one of the reasons this anthology happened. There's another by Antonio Machado, the Spanish poet, um, and he, of course, went through the Spanish Civil War and has a little poem called Coplas, which is very haunting. Coplas, in the high wilderness, I see some cold poplars and a white road. In that stony place, landscape of the moon, does no one remember it? The gusts of February rip through the lemon trees. I don't sleep, so I won't dream. Wonderful. It's a kind of fear in there that is really extraordinarily expressed. I, Bertolt Brecht is a central poet in this anthology, and when this book first came out, I was often asked, in May, I was asked, well, do you have any po poems that speak to the situation in Bosnia or Sarajevo? And of course, I didn't. The last uh, 
event in my anthology is the uprising at, and the repression at Tiananmen Square in China. But I said, well, there is a Brecht poem that might help us all to, to understand, or well, not understand, but at least live through and with these events in Bosnia. And it might inform us in some way. And there are two little excerpts. The first is from When Evil Doing Comes Like Falling Rain. The first time it was reported that our friends were being butchered, there was a cry of horror. Then a hundred were butchered. But when a thousand were butchered and there was no end to the butchery, a blanket of silence spread. When evil doing comes like falling rain, nobody calls out, stop. When crimes begin to pile up, they become invisible. When sufferings become unendurable, the cries are no longer heard. The cries, too, fall like rain in summer. That's, uh, that's very much to the point of what you say in the introduction about uh, Adorno's fear that, that we seek a kind of oblivion and yes. uh, avoidance of such memory. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Bertolt Brecht can also be a little funny. He uses a, the children's primer as a, as a model, as a form for his poem from a German war primer. And there's some very interesting little, little passages in this primer. Among them, um, he says, when the leaders speak of peace, the common folk know that war is coming. When the leaders curse war, the mobilization order is already written out. And then he, in a more serious note, and I think a very true one, he writes, the war which is coming is not the first one. There were other wars before it. When the last one came to an end, there were conquerors and conquered. Among the conquered people, the common people starved. Among the conquerors, the common people starved, too. Uh. And then the, in the last little excerpt, he says, this is something that I think can, we can all feel, too. And it is from the world's one hope. When a child is about to be run down by a car, one pulls it onto the pavement. Not the kindly man does that, to whom they put up monuments. Anyone pulls the child away from the car. But here, Many have been run down, and many pass by and do nothing of the sort. Is that because it's so many who are suffering? Should one not help them all the more because they are many? One helps them less. Even the kindly walk past, and after that, are as kindly as ever they were before walking past. So that's, a, in a way, a product of, <clears throat> of forgetting. Yeah. Yes. Well, it, it also is a way of explaining to ourselves that these things can happen. I remember when I was in, when I was a little girl, I used to think, if I had lived in Germany during the Second World War, I would have done something to stop the Holocaust. I would have worked against it. And then I lived in South Africa during the states of emergency. And I watched not a Holocaust, but a horrible repression of a population while the world stood by. And I began in, in my own terror to realize that such things happen and that people during these events, as we are doing with Bosnia Sarajevo, deliberate, well, what would be the best course of action? Historically, who knows how we will be judged or how, but uh, it made me think deeply about this. There's a, a poet in the anthology who was a prisoner of war of the Americans during the Second World War, Gunther Eich, and he wrote a poem that is uh, in the form of an inventory. I should say that many of these poems take interesting forms. Some of them borrow from religious forms, and they are hymns or chants or prayers, and then there are poems which take the form of anthems, national anthems, or or ironic anthems. And then in this poem, there's an inventory taken. And in many poems, inventories are taken. It's as if the poets are saying, what do we have left? Let's make a list. Let's discover what it is that we can still assemble. And Gunther Eich writes in inventory as a prisoner of war, this is my cap. This is my coat. Here's my shaving gear in a linen sack, a can of rations, my plate, my cup. I've scratched my name in the tin, scratched it with this valuable nail which I hide from avid eyes. 
In the food sack is a pair of wool socks and something else that I show to no one. It all serves as a pillow for my head at night. The cardboard here lies between me and the earth. The lead in my pencil I love most of all. In the daytime, it writes down the verses I make at night. This is my notebook. This is my tarpaulin. This is my towel. This is my thread. Wonderful. It seems amazing, but we're just about out of time. Oh, dear. Is there something <laughs> suitable to end with? Well, I would like to read Oh, the Chimneys by Nellie Socks. Um, and this is a poem by a woman survivor of the Holocaust. And it begins with the epigraph from Job. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Oh, the chimneys on the ingeniously devised habitations of death, when Israel's body drifted as smoke through the air, was welcomed by a star, a chimney sweep, a star that turned black, or was it a ray of sun? Oh, the chimneys, freedom way for Jeremiah and Job's dust. Who devised you and laid stone upon stone the road for refugees of smoke? Oh, the habitations of death invitingly appointed for the host who used to be a guest. Oh, you fingers laying the threshold like a knife between life and death. Oh, you chimneys, oh, you fingers, and Israel's body as smoke through the air. It's a translation by Michael Roloff. Wonderful and awful at the same time. Do you, could you read the little selection from Hannah Arendt? Of course, yes. We just have a few seconds, but maybe we'll. Hannah Arendt um, had a passage which explains, well, perhaps why one would want to do this and why it's not hopeless to bear witness and resistance doesn't fall into holes of oblivion. She says the holes of oblivion do not exist. Nothing human is that perfect, and there are simply too many people in the world to make oblivion possible. One man will always be left alive to tell the story. The lesson of such stories is simple and within everybody's grasp. Politically speaking, it is that, under conditions of terror, most people will comply, but some people will not. Humanly speaking, no more is required and no more can be reasonably asked for this planet to remain a place fit for human habitation. A wonderful place to end. Thank you very much. Thank you.